you'd like to learn a little more about what I do professionally, here's a link to my LinkedIn. Artificial intelligence and machine learning are all over the news, taking over academia, getting billions of dollars of commercial investment, and will change both computer networking and wireless communications in fundamental ways. So what is artificial intelligence and machine learning? Well, there's a lot of debate on the definitions. And since we don't have full consensus yet on what constitutes natural intelligence, and we're not entirely sure how our own minds and brains work, how in the world can we expect to define artificial intelligence? For telecommunications work, we have a somewhat easier job. General artificial intelligence, or what is often called strong AI, is something that most of us think of as being able to take over for a complete human. It would be expected to have competence in sensing and judging, it would take actions that are reasonable, would have some sense of the world, and would be able to manage to get through the day without setting off a nuclear bomb or driving a car off a cliff while performing duties at the same level, or better than, a human. We don't have this yet, and we may never have this. What we do have, and what is widely used in telecommunications, is artificially intelligent applications, or examples of something called machine learning, that focus on one particular aspect that a human would have otherwise done. For example, network operations, intrusion detection on a network, component design, software programming, emergency communications dispatch, and so on. Now for this conversation, artificial intelligence is more theoretical and abstract and is oriented towards questions of defining intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the source of the theoretical underpinnings that allow us to have practical implementations that do practical work. Machine learning is, in general, those specific practices or technologies. The difference is important for us as we learn about and deal with new ways of doing radio with software. AI, ML, artificial intelligence machine learning for short, is essentially software. Machine learning is when we train software to recognize patterns. It senses the environment, it runs an algorithm, and it produces a decision. Good machine learning operates as good or better than a person would in a particular task, such as deciding how to load ships in a port, or how to sort livestock for the best sales prices, or dispatching fire trucks on emergency calls. Artificial intelligence is physics, machine learning is engineering. When we talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, we shorten it to AIML. What does the future of amateur radio look like when radios use machine learning to operate? How does our relationship to the bands change with cognitive radio? Where are we in this transformation? And what will happen next? First, let's talk about what many people consider to be the fun part. Machine learning lets us identify the signals on the air nearly instantaneously. We can monitor all the bands all the time. We can know when our friends are online, what's hot for a contest, or spot rare DX the instant the call sign is transmitted. We can build a database of contacts and analyze who talks to who and when. We can predict with a very high degree of accuracy who is going to be on a satellite pass or available during an opening. We can use machine learning to figure out if that tropospheric duct during the summer is likely or not on a particular Saturday. We can analyze logbooks and get a lot of insight into how to win the next CQ Worldwide. Being able to know things that we didn't know before is a hallmark of machine learning. Artificial intelligence and machine learning doesn't create information. It reveals what the information might be able to tell us much faster than a human could. And this is very disruptive. It's also something that any competent radio operator in the future needs to know about. We're accustomed to a world where frequency privileges for the various radio services are coordinated like real estate. We're given permission to build our systems on stretches of bandwidth. Once we're there, we usually end up with something that looks a lot like land ownership. The property limits are set down and our access is described with a set of rules that cover things like channelization, power limits, interference constraints, and so on. When you look at a frequency allocation chart, it looks very much like a densely packed urban landscape with lots of mixed-use development. 
But bandwidth isn't dirt. The systems that we build aren't permanent in terms of their radio frequencies at all. The capital expenditures for towers and base stations and receiver handsets and radios and so on are certainly expensive and quite often involve actual real estate and investment, sometimes very contentiously if you've ever been involved in a dispute over tower placement. But the signals broadcast over the airwaves are completely ephemeral. With reconfigurable or adaptive radios, we can break free of the rigidly restrictive planned nature of spectrum management. The benefits of being able to redeploy entire wireless communication systems dynamically, it improves the use of spectrum and dramatically increases revenue and and something specifically important to the U.S. FCC, it contributes towards U.S. competitiveness. So let's pretend spectrum was handled exactly like real estate. Let's say we own a restaurant. Our restaurant is open during the day and closed at night. What if that restaurant could be turned into a completely different business overnight on demand? Like extra housing when there's a concert or game in town. What if, instead of being a restaurant every day, it could be an urgent care clinic on days of high demand for health care? While we can't do a trick like this for brick and mortar buildings, we are at a point where we are starting to be able to do this for wireless communication systems. And artificial intelligence and machine learning is a central enabling technology for adaptive telecommunications. AI ML will be at least as disruptive a technology as the transistor. It's here to stay, and amateur radio will be affected. There will be positive effects and negative effects. To get more of the former and less of the latter is up to us and how we respond to this very large technological change. So what is this adaptive radio frequency technology all about? The biggest bang for the buck is being able to break free of bandwidth constraints. This means that for many communications systems, the transmissions will not be associated strictly with a band. The function of the communication will be drive the form much more than it does today. Bandwidth is the frequency or span of frequencies used for a particular communications function. Bandwidth is also widely used to mean the rate of data delivered through a system. Data rate or throughput is closely related to and limited by the occupied frequency range of the channel, service, or transmission. But these two two terms, they're not really synonymous. So when we talk about the frequency range occupied by a signal, we should use bandwidth. And when we talk about the amount of data delivered by a signal per unit time, we should probably use throughput. Bandwidth, along with the signal-to-noise ratio, determines how close we are to achieving something called channel capacity. AI ML serves a big role in optimizing forward error correction codes. The channel capacity limits our ability to detect and correct errors in digital signals. It's a limitation that is related to the physics of entropy. Due to decades of productive work, there are a variety of error correcting codes that produce spectral efficiencies and therefore throughput very close to the channel capacity limit. Two examples of very high performance codes are polar codes used terrestrially in 5G and LDPC codes used in space within DVB-S2 and S2X protocols. With improved list decoding for polar codes, improved neural belief propagation decoding, and for detecting what forward error correction type was used in an intercepted signal where the receiver has no prior knowledge, Well, all of these things are things that AI ML directly helps with. The vision of cognitive radio is that radios will understand the environment dynamically and automatically change their parameters. They will learn from that experience, and the radio will experiment with new configurations. This is supposed to help the humans that use the radio. Dynamic spectrum allocation and high-performance cognitive radio have a desired destination. Reconfigurable radios that perfectly fill in a sea of noise floor with efficient and coordinated digital signals. So to do this, we need to be able to sense the spectrum. And it's believed that we have to have access to some sort of spectrum or operator database. Spectrum sharing increases utility and usability. A future amateur operator may not think of operation in terms of which band they're on at all. Spectrum access would be whatever is currently available, with the radio coordinating access and picking a frequency without any traditional band limitations, or identity, 
Instead of a waterfall and spectrum display, the ideal user interface of the future may be a set of channel metrics or a network graph for who you can reach. Clearly, AIML is a fundamental part of this cognitive radio future. So what does it take to change bandwidth dynamically and automatically? Well, non-trivial bandwidth agility requires high-performance components in the radio frequency chain. High performance usually means high cost. We may want to have extremely flexible radio systems that can do the cognitive radio thing, but can we afford the components required? Well, mostly no, but in some cases, yes. Affordability can be a metric for bandwidth usage. We have to inconvenience a relatively large number of electrons and molecules to get signals on the air. Dollars per hertz per second per square kilometer is how much it costs someone to get their signals on the air in a particular geographic area. We can start out by thinking how much it costs to buy a radio. $24.75 for a Baofeng UV5R dual band radio. This allows access to the 2 meter and 70 centimeter amateur bands in almost any place in the United States. Disregarding the very small number of places where operation might be restricted, the United States has 9.8 million square kilometers. Urban areas are about 3% of this. Individual signal bandwidths are small, but the allowed bands are 4 MHz and 30 MHz, respectively, for a total of 34 MHz. Range is limited by both power and the physics of the channel. Repeaters increase the range of individual radios. And repeater coverage in the U.S. is good. There are rural areas without repeaters, but with over 6,000 known repeaters on 2 meters and over 5,000 on 70 centimeters, let's assume at least the urban population of the U.S. has coverage. Since a very low cost, sometimes free, license exam, plus a very inexpensive radio gets you access to the bands, how affordable is it for the end user? Baofeng spent money to develop this radio. It didn't magically appear in the market fully formed at no cost. It cost the individual time and effort to study and take an exam, even a relatively simple one, as the U.S. Amateur Radio License Exam. Repeaters are not free either. However, we can see that the end user cost of accessing 2 meter 70 centimeter rounds down to zero dollars. The geographic area needs more scrutiny though. While an amateur radio operator can connect to a reflector and talk to anyone anywhere in the world, the footprint of the radio is a very modest small numbers of kilometers and not every repeater allows the end user to connect to chat rooms on the internet. If the only people you can reliably expect to communicate with are in a repeater footprint, then the geographic area is much smaller than the entire urbanized U.S. So the cost is still low, but let's look at the difference. Typical repeater usage is 80 kilometers out, so the accessible area would be about 20,000 kilometers. An amateur repeater and handset combination has a similar range to a cell site and phone. There are approximately 400,000 cell sites in the United States with coverage concentrated in urban areas. So the equivalent to a Baofeng would be something like a $200 Moto G. Cellular access isn't free, though, after you buy the equipment. Access is controlled by subscription. Average cost of a cell phone plan in the U.S. is about $113 in 2020. You generally sign up for a year, so we'll assume you have to pay at least a year's subscription to really access these bands as an end user. Since cell phones can contact anyone in the United States with a number, the geographic area is larger than the footprint of the cell site. Is it the entire U.S.? Well, yes, as long as you're in coverage. So let's take the 800 megahertz cellular system and assume that the bandwidth we access is one of the blocks that are 25 megahertz each. Assuming you can get a signal anywhere, this is what we end up with for cost. So what does all this mean? Well, the costs to the end user to access the airwaves in the United States are very low for both commercial and non-commercial services. Geographic reach through networking is the biggest capability difference between the two examples above. Can an end user call an arbitrary person by accessing the airwaves in the United States? Yes, with cellular voice. Contacting an arbitrary person outside of VHF UHF amateur radio is rare but not impossible. The capability is an optional extra on some repeater systems. So what do we have established here? We have a metric for the current planned fixed spectrum allocation style regulatory environment. We can calculate end user costs for bandwidth and throughput access in the United States, and it's pretty low. End users will most likely be expected to pay more in the future to access bandwidth more efficiently. AIML lets regulators raise expectations on our receivers as well as our transmitters. 
If we want the ability to control bandwidth to adapt to channel or market conditions, then we have to have better components. AIML can and does attack and address the component performance problem, and it's doing it today, mostly in the commercial sector. AIML serves a role in component design with lower power consumption and higher component performance as typical objectives. While licensed bandwidths are fixed, the actual used bandwidth is often dynamic. LTE and 5G air interfaces are basically a dynamic process of optimally assigning resources across frequency and time. Scheduler algorithms could be the playground of AIML to serve the same throughput with less resources and let the system be more supportive of different traffic models and use cases. That way, the same licensee may also operate in varying numbers of fixed licenses across the spectrum. So incorporating AI and ML in shared spectrum regimes and or unlicensed spectrum could be the key in making the applicable use cases commercially viable. In citizens' broadband radio service, for example, there is a part of the S-band allocated to general authorized access, divided in quantized fixed bandwidths. There's currently no mandate to coordinate their operation for coexistence. A centrally managed AIML could drastically improve their penetration, especially relevant to private 5G, Industry 4.0, and IoT. This makes it easier to share the spectrum with services like amateur radio. Amateur radio operators already do this, with a typical operator finding an open spot, calling CQ, or turn, tuning around and finding someone to call. The bands are not usually crowded enough to have the same incentive for coordinating calls, with some possible exceptions like busy FT8 and contest weekends. AIML operational assistance within existing LTE and 5G and CBRS systems can provide affordable benefits to the commercial sector. AIML operational assistance for amateur radio is highly situational. The technical debt incurred with fully flexible AIML generated radio architectures can exceed what any company or country or individual for sure can afford. We can get into plenty of trouble even without letting AIML help us design communication systems. For example, let's consider the Joint Tactical Radio System, or JITTERS, JTRS. The goal of this program was to replace existing legacy radios in the American military with a single set of software-defined radios that could be reconfigured in the field. Cognitive radio techniques were centered and marketed. Almost everything that we're talking about here today was part of the recipe for JTRS. However, the large size and weight need necessary to support the desired adaptability and flexibility turned out to be too high for a successful deployment. AIML wasn't the failure point. The policy, reasoning technology, and the spectral sensing and the adaptive waveform operations all worked. Successful prototype demonstrations are littered throughout the literature. The scope exceeded the grasp provided by the available hardware. If AIML is needed for anything in cognitive radio right now, it's to reduce the size and weight and power consumption of the circuits required to enable the desired levels of flexibility. This is an active area where AIML directly improves bandwidth access and agility. What do we currently manage to do in terms of bandwidth occupancy and allocation? There are people who look at this problem, and amateur radio will be directly affected. What would an AIML-assisted regulatory workflow look like? Well, it depends entirely on what data it was trained upon. An AIML model trained only on commercial data could annihilate every other use of the spectrum. We believe, and are gathered here today to celebrate, non-commercial uses of the spectrum. Non-commercial uses are valid and necessary. Educational, nonprofit, small business, amateur, scientific, military, and unlicensed value are all vulnerable in models that are trained only on large companies providing big commercial services. Even if those commercial services owe part or all of their success to non-commercial routes, if it isn't in the data set, it's not going to be in the model. AIML is only as good as the data it saw in training, and amateur radio does not have a clear advocacy here. What do we aspire to in terms of bandwidth occupancy? Well, we want to optimize bandwidth and throughput to best achieve communications goals, and those goals may be conflicting. One way to deal with this is to have regulatory agencies like the FCC. The FCC allocates bandwidth to produce activity that is judged to have positive social, economic, political, and security benefits in the United States. At this point, the only actors that can achieve this balance is humans. AIML does not yet replace the human in the regulatory loop. The training data required to perform a regulatory role has not been defined, tagged, or cleaned. 
AIML can and should be part of the process because of the enormous power it has to cut through properly defined search spaces. The entry point for this was the flood of fake comments about net neutrality received at the FCC. 18 million of the more than 22 million comments that the FCC received in the 2017 proceeding to repeal net neutrality rules were fake. Additionally, the Office of the Attorney General's investigation revealed that the fraud perpetrated by the various lead generators infected other government proceedings as well. The OAG report had four recommendations, including agencies to adopt technical safeguards to protect against unauthorized bulk submissions using automation. At the, at the FCC, this led directly to AIML being considered for the job. And this leads to questions about hey, why not use AIML for more regulatory functions? So what do we need to do in order to keep our bands in an age of AIML being used for technical, social, commercial, and even government work? AIML performance is entirely dependent on the quality of the data sets used to train the algorithms. So we need to be able to quantify usage of our bands and qualify the value of our service so that we can show up in the data sets used. This means making sure we're included by both humans and classical regulatory deliberations, which will continue for many years, and in the data sets being gathered for automated regulatory exploration. It's very clear that we need to be able to continue to participate in emergency communications. Emergency communications work is increasingly digital, integrated, and credentialed. Things like WinLink, which can interface directly with AIML network agents and served agency APIs, need to be able to work without impediment. And this means solving problems like the symbol rate restriction on amateur radio transmissions. AIML can seem like magic. It's an incredibly powerful technology that cuts through a search space and finds a solution many times faster than any human. However, there are some big drawbacks to AIML. These drawbacks go beyond a lack of inclusion in data sets. AIML is non-deterministic. Data sets are frequently limited in ways that can create substantial bias. AIML requires prediction validation. This is low risk when you're testing correctable designs like a power amplifier, but is higher risk when testing agents that control large communication networks or decide who is going to be allowed to go on the air. When AIML is applied to testable and well-defined search spaces in telecommunications and the target is a component or something like an error correction code or protocol, there can be amazingly good results and low risk. When AIML is applied to testable and well-defined search spaces in network management, then the results may be good and the risk may be low. When AIML is applied to untestable or very difficult to test circumstances, the only quality metric is the quality of the training data. Since we already know how badly things can go off the rails with bad data, any system providing untestable decisions should be considered high risk. There are many ways to mitigate risk. You can get insurance to pay for potential damage, you can keep humans in the loop. You can have the equivalent of automatic limit switches in the deployed environment, and, and so on. The technical complexity to mitigate risk adds on top of what may be a substantial technical investment already to train and deploy an AIML system. So liability discussions alone may make an AIML system too expensive to deploy. AIML in the regulatory loop feels like it breaks a rule. We expect to be able to know when we're being ruled by a machine, and we expect to be able to have some sort of appeal, but those rights are not yet guaranteed to you. In a future world where all the communi commercial communications, including emergency communications, might be advanced or complex AIML-assisted waveforms that all sound like noise and maximize revenue, where does something like FM narrowband voice fit in? It actually fits in very well, or it can. The future of amateur radio may look exactly like it looks today. Our signals would simply be avoided by the automated radios that direct all the other traffic around us. The only thing we'd hear in terms of interference would be a minor rise in the noise floor. This isn't a terrible outcome for the hobby. It is the equivalent of amateur radio being declared a national park or nature preserve, but it would tend to cut off amateur radio from the dominant experimental path in wireless communications. Especially if the cost of participating in modern AIML systems, whether financial or too steep of a learning curve, is higher than the average individual really wants to pay. If amateur radio doesn't look like modern communications because it's protected and preserved, 
it could lose some of its educational value along with some of its practical emergency communications value. When you look at the regulations for the amateur services in the United States, you can see that educational training and emergency communications make up almost entirely all of the justifications for its existence. What this model, you know, amateur radio as national park or nature preserve, what this model doesn't lose is freedom. If you have a place to play radio, learn and meet people from around the world or, or around the county if you're on 24 gigahertz, then this is a very good thing. Amateur radio doesn't have to become all about reconfigurable fancy radios to remain valuable. It can and should continue to allow all things, advanced experimentation and simple unscheduled QSOs with other people. So where are we in AI ML transformation? It kind of depends on who you ask. For commercial operators, their answer depends on how exposed their customers are to AI ML agents and decision making. In commercial networks, AI ML is rapidly becoming a necessary tool for managing the complex network configurations that may have thousands of distinct values. The sheer complexity of protocols like 5G outstrip human capacity to manage if 5G is to be fully deployed and if that deployment is expected to be efficient. How can we showcase amateur radio in a world rapidly being taken over by AI ML products? How can we defend ourselves from AI ML itself being part of the regulatory loop? How can we possibly compete with billions of dollars of commercial AI and ML work, especially when almost all the really good stuff is still secret or proprietary? Strictly speaking, we don't have to. We aren't about optimizing revenue. There is no expectation that all amateur radio operators have to keep up with everything going on in radio tech. We're about building international goodwill through serendipitous contacts over the air with other human beings, and we need to stick up for that. However, we're also capable of keeping up with the times. Here's at least one path forward that shows how adaptable and relevant we can be in terms of the technology. Our ability to transmit on our own frequencies is of enormous equalizing value. We have access to very inexpensive SDRs and powerful computers. We have enough operators and enough density for a lot of us to become really very competent at cognitive radio, AI, and ML. What we don't have is a practical curriculum or handbook of reference designs. We need a practical ham-centric curriculum or handbook, something that can be extended to the classroom or learned individually. This would give us traction on being able to participate and show educational value in the future. We didn't ignore the transistor. We cannot ignore AI ML. Are you interested in helping achieve this goal? To create a handbook or a set of lessons or a workbook, would you be willing to sign up to try out some experiments with ham radio that could become a practical course in ham-centric AI ML? Open Research Institute is coordinated with a couple of schools that are willing to pilot educational AI ML program material. And ORI is very interested in developing some self-directed work. You shouldn't have to be in a university or an engineering program to take advantage of what's going on with AI ML. And it really needs to be easier to learn. Anyway. ORI will host a kickoff meeting for this initiative and is actively looking for organizations and individuals that want to collaborate and lead forward on this effort. You can sign up at our booth here at Ham Expo or write ORI directly at hello at openresearch.institute. No personal information is ever shared or sold by ORI. All work, work is published and made available to the general public for free. Thank you. Let's continue the conversation. Okay. Hello, thank you. Uh, yeah, hi, we have a number of uh, good questions here in chat. I'm gonna go ahead and share them on the screen. First of all, um, introduce myself. I'm Carol, KP4MD, I'm the moderator. Michelle is our speaker. So I'm going to go ahead and drop myself out of the- Oh, Carol, I don't think we can hear you. Um, if you wanted to introduce the questions, uh, come on back. Sure. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> uh, yes. So has uh, machine learning been used to automatically identify digital modulation types? Yes. This is one of the first things um, that was, was really kind of noteworthy about uh, uh, AI ML and digital communications. And um, yes, it's extremely good at it. This is an, a very good use case for AI ML. It's, it's pretty focused and the data is, you can get lots and lots of data about 
um, modulation types uh, from making IQ recordings. And it's really very, very effective. So within 40 symbols or less, uh, with a very high degree of precision, there's a number of, of models uh, that you can get access to. These are open source. Um, and that your, your modulation is identified. So AIML has contributed a huge uh, amount of leverage to what we call uh, autonomous receiving, you know, a receiver that you don't have to configure in advance that will simply listen and recognize signals. Uh, so that, that focused uh, identification that's very, very quick has been extended to taking in great swaths of bandwidth and doing something called spectral observation. Uh, so what you do is you listen to a whole band and in parallel, your algorithm identifies the type of signal uh, and and can actually go ahead and, and not just identify the modulation type, but also decode. Uh, and in cases where it understands the protocol or the protocols open to go ahead and deliver all the data to you. So this is, this is something that happens and is used um, by researchers and, and hobbyists and, and definitely used in commercial applications. And the next one is pretty long. Uh, let's see how this shows here on the screen. And this is from Sterling uh, N0SSC. Uh, my gosh, I, the whole thing doesn't show on the screen. It's so long. Uh, I don't know how you can scroll down to see the rest, but there, there is a question here. Why don't I go ahead and read this? I'm going to have to hide it off the screen here. Um, my big fear of radio spectrum as enabled by cognitive radio is that the highest bidders that we know of today, uh, Verizon, AT&T, DOD, SpaceX, etc., are going to do their best to buy the farm and be given significant weighting by the powers that be to use more spectrum, while secondary users such as amateur radio will have to fit and squeeze in between the gaps. That's kind of like the ideal future. But what happens when there's no more gaps to squeeze into? I think you completely understand the concern. <laughs> so yes, uh, strongly agree. That is the concern. When you start talking about efficient use of spectrum, um, which is a stated goal uh, at the FCC uh, and by, by all sorts of commercial um, folks, then What's left if your if your definition of efficiency is only about revenue and commercial uh, people like the ones that you've listed, uh, then yes, that is a concern. Um, so it, it this takes kind of a multi pronged uh, effort. Um, we have to continue and and increase really our our efforts, long you know decades long efforts to uh, represent our service properly to to regulatory agencies so that they're aware that we exist, so that we don't have to squeeze into gaps. Um, so that has to continue. And then we we ourselves as operators have to become familiar with the, the, the technology, uh, what's going on um, and what might be uh, at stake. Uh, so it's uh, it sort of takes a, a awareness um, and act activity, uh, action, activism uh, from the regular towards the regulatory process to make sure that the thing that you're talking about doesn't happen. Okay, here's the next one. This is from D, KM6MTL. It looks like AI and machine learning will be using digital types of modulation, while analog types of modulation can still be used. Oh, yes. This is an excellent question because um, when we talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, it's almost always within the context of, of software and software running on digital computers and software that's managing digital communications. However, uh, analog signals can be controlled by AI ML as well. Um, and in an environment where there is lots and lots of different types of signals, um, it would be my, I think, hope and preference is that all of our uh, modulation types would continue to have, have a home. We'd still be able to use it. Um, in the, the most severe case, uh, you know, the, there are people who are worried that eventually you, you simply wouldn't be allowed to use anything except digital communications. And those communications would have to be organized through some sort of centralized uh, computer in order to achieve full efficient use of the spectrum. Now that's a pretty extreme view, uh, but it's, it's good to kind of keep it in mind because the assumptions of a lot of, of regulatory agencies are uh, that that's what people want. And when they say people, they mean uh, commercial interests. 
So, you know, yes, AI ML can actually be used with, with analog uh, signals. It's a, it's, it's a very interesting sort of use case. And, and yes, there sh you should be concerned about uh, uh, traditional modes and, and their future. Well, this one is more of a comment than a question. Uh, again, it's, uh, okay, yeah. Sterling, <laughs> yeah. OMG, JTRS, my living hell. Uh, perhaps you can uh, just comment on this yourself. Oh, boy. Well, yeah, I, I brought up JTRS as an example of, and, uh, the, you know, uh, of course, this is, I'm going to, somewhat opinionated here, but, the, you know, JTRS as, as something that leveraged artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, aspects and, and all of that uh, didn't succeed. And for lots of different reasons, but it was uh, everybody that has worked on it and has, it was pretty brutal. So this was a, a tough go. Uh, it's never really fun when something you pour a lot of time and effort into doesn't get deployed. Uh, lots and lots of lessons learned. Uh, so, uh, so Sterling, you have only empathy from me and a lot of other people. And, you know, thank you for your efforts to try to get, uh, you know, a, a reconfigurable, you know, uh, replacement system uh, up and running. Okay, next one is uh, from John, WA7UAR. I think the use of the VITA 49 protocol will have a profound impact on future AI ML HAM model. Are you familiar with this protocol and have you any insights of your own? Yes, I'm familiar with the with Vita 49, and I think the only my only criticism of it is that the flexibility of the protocol um, tends to to make people pick subsets of it, and interoperability is a little bit of a challenge. But, but Vita 49 has been tremendously useful uh, because it puts metadata, uh, and metadata is what it's all about. So so AI ML is is helped by any sort of meta, metadata or tagging. And this is a very widely used and popular protocol. So I like it. Um, and I, I, so yes, thumbs up for me. Okay, here's another one. This is uh, Mike, uh, W7VO says, does AIML take the fun? And importantly, the challenges of human learning out of amateur radio. It, that is a, an excellent question. And the answer is, yeah, it can. Um, AIML is affecting not just um, amateur amateur radio activities, uh, you know. So when you talk about human learning out of amateur radio, AIML is also taking a lot of the fun out of making art. So if you've seen in the news lately, um, both Dolly and uh, the open source uh, version, that uh, artists are, are in a bit of a uh, uproar, some of them, about um, art being harvested uh, from the from across the internet, thrown into an, a machine learning algorithm, and out pops art at a rate that no human could ever keep up with. So yes, AIML has a profound potential because it's it's so powerful and disruptive of taking the fun out of a lot of different things. Okay, so having said that, it's up to you to simply assert that I enjoy doing these things, and it, it doesn't matter to me that it can be replaced uh, by a computer program, and enjoy the snot out of amateur radio. Uh, so, so that's kind of, it's, it's, it is sort of a matter of both perspective and attitude, um, you know, but you don't stop there because, uh, you know, anytime that we've managed to automate something in our history, we, we usually end up keeping the fun aspects of the thing that we automated and also stepping forward uh, and finding something completely new. Uh, so there's there's plenty that still can be done in amateur radio, and it will change amateur radio uh, in, in ways that we simply can't predict today. Okay, well, this is one is just kudos from Andrew, AL7U. Very interesting presentation. Uh, next, we do have a question from Scott. This is K7TTN. Can we protect, protect these spectrums through leveraging a significant need for expanded educational opportunities? Well, I sure hope so. Um, since part of our justification is education, uh, that seems like a good angle to, to emphasize. Um, I think we all are aware of how many people got into engineering or you know, working in, in all sorts of different technical fields uh, through amateur radio. 
And if you didn't have it, then it begs the question, well, if you didn't have amateur radio, then how in the world would these people have ended up, yeah, you know, productive engineers um, or, or at least being appreciative of, of engineering? So I think education needs to be continually emphasized, the, the power of education and the accessibility, uh, just the wonderful experience of, of learning through amateur radio. So I would strongly agree that spectrum defense um, needs to continue to emphasize education as a justification and as a component. Okay, this is an interesting question. This is from uh, Keith, WA0TJT. I have a net logging program. I would like to use AIML to hear and suggest the call sign of stations checking in during bad band conditions. Can this be done? Yes, it can be done. That is a very good application for, um, for voice recognition. And voice recognition is a, a hugely successful part of machine learning. Now, the challenge with this particular uh, application is that you would have to have a pretty a large enough data set, recordings during bad band conditions of people trying to give their call signs. Um, now, that data set might exist uh, because lots of people have been recording uh, contests and, and de expeditions. Uh, more and more recordings exist uh, because of things like web SDR um, or spectral observatories. So, as far as I know, no one has done this specific application, but uh, with some effort into collecting and then tagging, you know, saying, okay, this recording is actually this call sign. Okay, so that's the trick. Say, so this, this all, all the set of data is this call sign, traditional way of doing machine learning. So that's kind of a big job. About 90% of the, of the work in a machine learning algorithm is data cleaning. Uh, data organizing, and then then you turn the the algorithm loose, and and then it is able to predict things from new recordings. There's also deep learning where you don't have to do this process. Um, as far as I know, it hasn't been done yet, but this is an excellent example of what can be done uh, with machine learning techniques. Okay, we have a number of other comments here. This one is. Uh... Oh, uh, this is my friend Mark, uh, WA3QWA. Isn't AI being used for intelligence band scanning? And uh, he continues here and he says, uh, for ex uh, that is NSA, CIA, and the patterns, numbers, et cetera. And the answer is a emphatic yes. That's being used today for intelligent band scanning and uh, inter you know, monitoring and, and intercepts. Okay, so um, interesting. So uh, Big Brother is listening to us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, we have another question here. This is from Luke, KJ7BKH. Is there any working project to pull out call signs? I have tried that for a project. It didn't work well. Oh, yes. This is an excellent question. So it's related to the one about you know, can you recover a call sign during bad band conditions? Um, so I will check out your repository and I will, uh, I'll go see if there's any, anything else. Um, it's, it's in the category of speech recognition. Uh, so I'm assuming you mean like spoken or CW call signs. So a lot of the, the, the pretty well-developed libraries should be able to, to help with pulling out call signs. It depends on getting it really good training data. And, and that, I think, is the bottleneck for this particular uh, application. Going back here, Mark, uh, WA3QWA, again, asks about intelligent band scanning. Is the FCC using that? Well, that's a good question. Um, quite possibly, but the but I would say, mm, I, so I'm going to say I don't, I don't know for sure, uh, unlike some of the other agencies where I am for sure. They are using intelligent band scanning. The FCC doesn't generally collect a lot of data on its own. So they will take in data sets and they're primarily uh, oriented towards keeping close track of who is licensed on which band. So that is their premier data set, uh, like in the ULS. Uh, but in terms of like spectral observatory and, and recording, uh, generally 
generally speaking, the FCC doesn't do that sort of work. That's other agencies that you previously mentioned. Well, I can I can imagine a nightmare that they would be monitoring all the bands for any violations of Part 97 <laughs> and have the machine automatically issue you a, a, a notice of violation. Can you imagine that? Oh, boy. <laughs> Um, I don't see any other um, questions in chat right now. Good number of questions there. Yeah, that covers uh, some amazing stuff. And, and it sounds like people are very, they're aware this is disruptive stuff um, that can sort of crowd us out. Um, you know, if everybody is, if everybody else is doing it. And it's um, you know making the big carriers lots and lots of money, and they keep telling us that they need more spectrum. So if we're if we're not well represented and show that that we are distinct and that we deliver value, you know, and, and that's 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 nothing new. This is the same um, game. Um, I'm going to say that in air quotes. It's, it's the same thing that we've had to do for decades. Um, it's just that with AI ML, uh, since these are very powerful tools. Um, once the tool is then being used in the regulatory loop, or or if it, the demands for spectral efficiency uh, make it to where we, we don't look like we belong, uh, those things are, are, are going to come to a head at some point, probably earlier than we expect. And so there's our, that's the concern. And I think that people recognize that. The flip side is that this technology is amazing and can really transform your experience um, uh, operating uh, on the bands. It, it really opens up a lot of a very powerful um, ways to do things and can make a for an extremely flexible advanced radio. You can get stuff out of the, you know, dig stuff out of the uh, the noise that you never thought you could, could get to. Um, and it kind of puts you into a category of people that, that are really kind of up to date with, uh, with cutting edge stuff. And that doesn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly monitored. Her yes, she's on a list. Um, yeah, this is uh, another <laughs> question here, and this is from Raul uh, W7RPS. Is the ARL taking a role in championing championing amateur radio needs? Uh, well, I think this is a little off topic, but <laughs> this is what the league is there for. And those of you who are members are. The league. The league is comp comprised of its members, and it depends on input from all the members to go ahead and to champion our needs, championing yeah, can, our needs. I can chip in some some uh, an enthusiastic yes here. Um, there's there's at least three of us that are active uh, on FCC and FCC working groups, um, mm -hmm. and the, those working groups are dealing directly with AIML regulations. So ARL is specifically represented by Greg Lapine at the FCC, and and he is very interested and aware of these these issues. So I would say yes, ARL is taking a role in championing championing amateur radio needs in this particular category. You may not see it, um, you know, cropping up in like the pages of QST yet. Uh, but to reassure everybody, yeah, ARL is, is active and is at the right place. Well, I'm gonna bring up a, a previous question because uh, Keith has a follow-up on this thing about his net logging program. And uh, this is the, uh, the follow-up question he has for that. In the case of my earlier question, I would limit the input to the AIML to just the net in operation I already do some of this in Net Control Manager. I guess that's uh, just okay. The, uh, yeah, that, that, yeah, it does. It changes. It changes it a little bit because you have um, usually in in Nets, you probably know who's going to be checking in. You at least the Nets that I've participated in, you have a a, a list of people, and so subset might check in every week or. Or however often the net is so yeah that actually it, it can make it a little easier uh, on the algorithm to to fill in the names of the uh you know fill in the calls and, and perhaps you've already this will be my own my own uh question and uh, perhaps you already covered this but this aiml this is applicable to both a digital and analog voice as well as digital data is that correct 
it it's more often much more often applied to digital signals because it, since it's software computer software algorithms there's a, sort of a natural fit with the creation of digital signals but it can be applied to any phenomenon for example voice recognition um you know it, it, essentially this is a, a an analog waveform yes usually uh, digitized and and presented to the algorithm in a digital format but you know that in order for for AIML to, to grasp anything uh, you know it is going to have to get into the computer somehow however analog signals can be recognized you know and and dealt with and uh, for computer vision and uh, voice recognition are probably the two most successful areas of AIML and those things start out as analog signals so uh, you're saying that would also be applicable things like uh radio teletype uh jt65 or whatever uh, uh anything pack, yeah anything that can be measured anything that can be can be received or measured um sure. is fair game mm -hmm. and it, and it doesn't have to be one type of data the probably the the best way to see uh, how powerful um, machine learning is is when you start mixing different data types um, and presenting you know, different types of data that at first may seem to be unrelated. Uh, and these algorithms can find hidden relationships between uh, two different data sets and can produce some remarkably accurate predictions. This doesn't always happen. Um, but this is this is where kind of the, the best traction uh, can be had. This include things like telemetry and images as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's called sensor fusion. So if you have a, a big data set that is radio and you combine it with, let's say, satellite weather data. Mm -hmm. So if these communications, these radio communications are affected by weather, you're going to be able to measure and see that. Uh, and you're going to you're going to be able to make some predictions that you otherwise wouldn't be able to make. Um, and so that's just one example of, of you know, taking you're taking two different data sets and then you're adding them together and you're generating a result that is greater than the sum of the two parts. So that's essentially sensor fusion. Very possible with the uh, ML. Uh, Scott, uh, K7TTN asked, how well could or does AIML recognize legitimate signals within the noise floor? Uh, pretty well. So any, because it can use any digital technique in order to, to get them out of there. And it's uh, very good at this. There's a another example, like when you, um, like if you have satellite pictures of, of, for example, the surface of the ocean. Um, one of the first applications of, of computer vision was figure out what, what submarines are, are traveling along uh, just based on tiny little changes that it would detect somewhat similar to, to detecting signals um, below the noise. Okay, uh, another, uh, this is Luke. Uh, it says, where is this? Oh, you want the link. Okay, well, we have a link here is uh, Antrac, is that the one? This link right here? I don't recognize that. I don't know how that got in. <laughs> I am so sorry. <laughs> but if yeah. you if you want the link to um to helping out on on coming up with some ideas for the handbook of like what would be fun for amateur radio operators to play around with and learn about uh, using AIML, then then go to our booth, the uh, Open Research Institute booth here at Ham Expo, and click on the AIML handbook link and give us your info and 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 then we'll uh we'll kick things off uh, after Ham Expo. So everybody's welcome. It doesn't matter if you know nothing about AIML or if you're already an expert, uh, we wanna hear from you uh, because we want this to be fun and useful for, for amateur radio to give a, a handbook of practical things that you can do, um, you know, and, and to, to kind of carry you up a little bit on the learning curve. Okay, well, I think, uh, let me see if there are any more no, I don't see any further uh, questions or comments in the chat room. So, uh, Michelle, I want to thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Oh, thanks thank so much for your, thanks so much for your help. It's been really fun.
very well. I hope the rest of you enjoyed the rest of the QSO today, Ham Expo and 73 Soul. Gonna end the stream now.